Hey everyone, Houston Math Prep here. If you recall from working with parametric equations in 3D space, these equations for x, y, and z, written in terms of a parameter t like this, they represent a line in 3D space. In our Calculus 3 video series, we looked at how these parametric equations tell us both a point that the line goes through and a vector in the direction of that line. What we're going to do now is show you a way that we can represent a path like this in 3D space using a different notation but really writing all of this information in a single function. The way we'll do that is to consider each equation as a component of a vector, and we'll call this function r of t. So r of t represents all of this information for x, y, and z that we have for the path in space above, but in vector form, we'll call this type of function a vector-valued function. This vector-valued function tells us about all the points on the path in 3D space, but it does it in a slightly different way. Vector-valued functions in 3D space can be thought of as having components x of t, y of t, and z of t. A vector-valued function identifies a curve in space by actually defining vectors from the origin to all points on that curve. So you'll notice that plugging in a specific value for t actually gives us a vector, and that vector points to a particular point on the curve through space showing you how our vector-valued function r of t on the screen here defines a line through space, we'll just start with the vector that we get when t equals zero and the point that vector points to. As we start letting the t value get larger, you can see that the vector from the origin is changing, pointing to different places in 3D space, and you can see that the pattern of locations that this vector-valued function points to makes up a line. If we specified some interval for t, we'd only get part of the curve, in this case a line segment. But if we let t take on any possible value, then we'll get the entire path through 3D space. Now we're just going to take you through several examples of vector-valued functions and how we might be able to visualize some other paths through space defined as vector-valued functions when those paths are not a line. So here we have the vector-valued function r equals 4 cosine of t, comma 4 sine of t, comma 3. If we ignore for a moment the z component here and we focus on what a path in 2D space might look like with the components 4 cosine of t and 4 sine of t, this gives us a circular path in the xy plane. Now thinking about this extra requirement that z equals this constant 3, if that's the case, then this circular path that all the vectors in this function point to are going to be contained entirely in the plane z equals 3. So our vector-valued function defines a curve in space that is a circle of radius 4, but it lies completely within the plane z equals 3. Here's another function, r equals 0, comma, 3 cosine of t, comma, 5 sine of t. We can see right away in our first component that we have the constant 0. So this means that the curve in space lies entirely in the plane x equals 0. Now looking at the y and z components together, you might think this is another circular path in the yz plane, but because the coefficients 3 and 5 are different values, our path actually varies a bit more in the z direction than it does in the y direction. So this actually represents an ellipse instead of a circle. If we leave the y and z components of our vector-valued function alone and change the formula for the x component to something like t, think about what this does to our path in space defined by the function. When we're looking straight on toward the yz plane, the path will still look like an ellipse. But as the value for t gets larger, we won't be staying in the plane x equals 0 anymore. The x value will be increasing, so our path is moving forward in space as it traces an elliptical shape in the y and z directions. This gives us a helix, what looks like a coil in 3D space, that has an elliptical shape to it. For our next example, you'll notice here that the cosine and sine terms are located in the x and z components of the vector-valued function. So we should be starting to get an intuition that this means we'll have some kind of circular motion, perhaps, if we look in the direction of the xz plane. And in fact, the path in space defined by this vector-valued function will lie exactly in the xz plane, since our y component for the function is 0, and y equals 0 is the equation for the xz plane. 
Let's again change our constant component to something else. So here I've changed it to be negative t. We'll still have our same circular shape in terms of x and z, but now as we allow the values for t to get larger, the y component will be getting more and more negative. So we get a helix here again. This time the helix is circular due to the same coefficients on the x and z components. Both are 6. And this time our helix is coiling in the negative y direction. One final example here, we've got r equals 2 cosine t comma 2 sine t comma 6e to the negative t over 4. Now we should be professionals by now at determining what's going on in terms of x and y. As we look down at the xy plane, we have a circle of radius 2. But our z value, this exponential function with the negative coefficient, this represents the idea of exponential decay. So our z component starts positive, but as t gets larger, the value for z gets closer and closer to zero, and we get a path that spirals toward the xy plane, but approaches it more and more slowly as it gets close to it. All right, everyone, thanks for watching our introduction to vector-valued functions. We'll see you in the next video.